Hey guys, Vaughn Scow here, and welcome to first day of class. Um, this is, in fact, the introductory lecture to the brand new online uh, section of COM270 at Vol State College in Gallatin. This is a course that I've taught in the traditional sense since, uh, I believe, nine, 1998 or 99, a long time. Uh, so we're off on a brand new adventure together, and I, I think it's going to be a I think it's going to be a lot of fun. It'll be fun for me, and I hope it's fun for all of you as well. Um, we will, in fact, be more or less going through our book, Audio Basics, by Stanley uh, Alton. And I'm going to tell you this, though. You have the book, so read the book. Okay? I'm not going to read the book for you. I'm going to give you material that I think will augment your textbook, which is required, and I'm going to give you some little pieces that maybe I think uh, should be in the textbook but, but aren't. And certainly I will be highlighting some of the things that are, in fact, in the textbook. Okay? If you hear me say it, it's important. When I give these weekly lectures, by the way, I will have in my hand the quiz that you will be taking online. So when you see me consult the piece of paper, you might know that it's a point that will be somewhat important to you guys. Okay, so there you go. I tell you what, this is going to be basically like a little 10-15 minute condensed version of the same introductory lecture that you were to get if you were to sit uh, in the brick and mortar class at Vol State. And I uh, hope you enjoy. I'm a little corny. I can't help it. Um, I hope that'll in, uh, enhance your learning experience. There you go. Uh, for those of you who don't like corny, feel free to, you know, whatever. Just listen to the audio of this thing and not watch it. It won't be nearly as bad that way. Um, I'm going to tell you right up front. Here's a little, a little piece of what I give my students. The music business is a great place to be. What's awesome about the music business is that, uh, and I've been in the music business here in Nashville for um, 30 plus years. Uh, and I've done nothing but music in my entire life since I've been 15 uh, years older or younger. The great thing about the music business is that you are judged on what you really do. You're not judged on what you look like, which means uh, this is good for me. I'm both a freak and a geek. I'm five foot three inches tall, which makes me kind of a geek. And, uh, you know, I like to grow my hair out and stuff like that. So that makes me a bit of a freak. In the music business, nobody cares. If you're a recording engineer, they don't care about your tattoos, your piercings, um, your choice of clothes to wear. People might care if you know you choose to not bathe or something like that, but that's you all get there's a practical side to that. What you will be uh, definitely uh, 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 judged on is your honest to goodness real knowledge. Do you really know your stuff or not? Okay, and that's if you're an engineer, a producer, a player, a writer. Man, you either got it or you don't. You can't fake this stuff, okay? So there, um, that's the good part. The good part about being uh, in this wonderful business that I hope you all have, in fact, sort of decided maybe you want to go in, is that people don't care what you look like. They don't care about that stuff. They only care about you being the real deal. So pay attention. Be the real deal. Now, we are going to start on the intro lecture to audio basics. The first thing it talks about is what sound is. Now what sound is in a room, in an acoustic space, is basically molecules of air smacking into molecules of air. Okay? It's like, consider it when I have this stuff coming out of my mouth, it's almost like a wreck on the interstate. And some of you are going, yeah, I get that. Uh, right? I mean, it's like, I compress air molecules that smack into air molecules that then smack into other air molecules that then smack into air, other air molecules. You got that? Okay? And as a matter of fact, um, everything we're going to talk about in audio has to do with two things. Everything. All of it. These are the most important things. I'm going to draw this graph. And this is something that we will come back to throughout the course. Okay? Draw this for yourself. It will be helpful. You have a rectangle. Okay? My art skills ain't great. The bottom of this rectangle we are going to call the frequency range. Okay? 
And we are going to consider the frequency range of average perfect human hearing. The lowest things we can hear are 20 hertz. And the highest things we can hear are about 20,000 hertz, which can be abbreviated 20K. Pretty simple, right? And what that means, the hertz, which people will call cycles per second, um, I think there's a few other British ways of putting it too. Fre uh, frequency, basically, is what we're talking to about. And what we're talking about there is the time it takes for one complete molecule to smack into a molecule and then that one to bounce and smack into the next molecule. Okay? Pretty easy. Now, on the other end of our scale here, you know, we can consider these x and y axes, we have the amplitude. So this is, this is frequency, or, you know, pitch is what we often call it. On the other end, we have the volume, or the loudness. The quietest things, in theory, that humans can hear is zero decibels, okay? The loudest things that we can hear before, generally speaking, we're probably going to start damaging our hearing, is about 120 decibels. Okay, so this represents everything that happens in the human hearing experience, from the lowest frequencies we can hear to the highest frequencies we can hear, from the quietest things we can hear to the loudest things we can hear. Yes, there are things that happen outside of this box, but if they're below here, we ain't gonna hear them because our ears ain't, ain't capable. If they're above here, again, not gonna hear it. Dogs might, bats might, we won't. If it's above this threshold of 120 decibels, oh yeah, lots of things in life are that loud. Lots of rock concerts, right? A lot, you know, you, you go up and stick your head in the back end of a jet engine. Sure, it's gonna be louder than that. It'll also blow your eardrums. I suggest you don't go there. Okay, so I hope you have a feel for this. This is your introduction. Get the idea. The frequency of something, which is the speed at which it's smacking into the next molecule, Okay, this is in hertz, which is complete cycles per second. Okay, in other words, the complete time of a smack and the next smack that happens in one second. Okay, these low frequencies, that's a big old smack, right? It's these little to be high frequencies up here. Yeah, lots of little smacks. And this, the volume, that's basically the size of the smack. That's the number of molecules that have been put into motion. There you go. Okay, I think we're done. <laughs> you got the whole course right now. Now all we need to do is to figure out within that box how we manipulate things, right? Okay, so I do want you to read in your book the section on frequency and amplitude, what we just talked about, frequency. Amplitude. Got it? Okay, cool. Uh, I do want to mention that within that, uh, what I just described, that smack, is something that is called the sound envelope. The book has a nice little picture of the sound envelope, uh, and it is, in fact, right here on page 7 of your book. And what you will notice is something called ADSR, Attack, Decay, Sustain, and Release. The attack is the time it takes for the initial smack to happen. Something like a snare drum that's very fast. Something like a wind instrument that's kind of slow. The decay is how long then before it starts to get quieter. Sustain is how long it kind of hangs out at that sort of reduced volume level. And then finally release is how long it takes that sound to fade into nothingness. Yeah, cool. Attack, to case, sustain, release. Uh, when we start learning about compressors, expanders, gates, we'll realize that we can take this sound envelope and change it into something we want. Yeah. Say you're a recording engineer, you got a fluffy old kick drum. And you're working on a metal band. Who wants that? You want... Right? Well, guess what? We can take that slow attack and speed it up. We can take that slow decay and we can speed it up. Yeah, we'll talk about that as we get going. Uh, good stuff, huh? Okay, so 
What I want to mention is when we're talking about air molecules in a room, as measured by a handy dandy little SPL meter, right, we are in fact talking about SPL. That is sound pressure level. Oh, for those of you who haven't seen it, I have my quiz sheet in front of me now. Sound pressure level is in fact a measurement of the number of air molecules in motion, right? It's how hard the air hits this microphone right here. Okay? That is what our ears hear as how loud something is. Pretty easy, right? So in other words, what we're looking at with sound pressure, SPL, volume in a room, is we're actually looking at the amount of pressure. Air molecule pressures. Atmospheric pressure. Do you get that? Cool stuff, huh? Um, so by the way, if I were to take in here and draw, you know, something like, um, you know, a little, you've all seen something like that before, right? And I say, ooh, this is a sound wave. Pretty cool, huh? Oh, and by the way, this is called the peak of the wave, and this is called the trough of a wave, and this, the peaks correspond to the point of smack, and the troughs correspond to the point where it bounces back, okay? The point of smack is called compression. In the sound wave, that's where they're compressed together. The point where they pull away the most is called refraction. Compression and refraction in the sound wave. And that complete cycle we're talking about that determines frequency is the distance that it takes to complete one cycle. Cool stuff, huh? Okay, we getting that? Yeah, that's frequency. Um, oh, and what I just drew here, this waveform that I drew, this is a graphic representation of sound in a room, right? In the old days, we had oscilloscopes going way back to, I don't know, like the 40s or 50s where you could look at it this way. These days, generally speaking, we look at waveforms on our computer monitors and in computer programs and apps and our iPad and stuff like that, um, which is awesome because oscilloscopes cost a lot of money and they were big. Um, let's see. Couple things I want to highlight here again. These could be quiz questions. Um, is that that process I've described of molecules smacking into molecules? That's a physical process. Physical. It's not electric, right? It's not in the electromagnetic spectrum. It's just a physical process. And what that means is it's relatively slow. The sound at which, or uh, the speed at which sound propagates or travels through air is only about 760 miles per hour, right? Which corresponds to 1,130 feet per second, 1130 feet per second, okay? You go any faster than that in an airplane and you have broken the sound barrier, right? Which means that you make that sonic boom. Um, there's not a lot of planes other than military planes these days that are flying above the speed of sound now that the Con Concorde has been grounded. Um, and that is basically because the thing that's making the sound is fat traveling faster than the sound can propagate or the sound can travel and so it clumps up in little pieces. Interesting, huh? Okay, so, uh, but that's not that fast, right? I mean, light travels at like 600 million miles per hour, right? And, you know, and electrons as electricity traveled on a cable at that speed. So sound is relatively slow to propagate. Think about that. Factor that in. Um, okay, uh, I want to mention something called phase. This theoretical sound wave that we just drew here, you could also say that this point, which we called compression, and this point that we called refraction, you could also say that that is the positive and negative portions of the wave, right? And if you're looking at it on an oscilloscope, that's what this is, right? I mean, if this is zero, this is the most negative spot, and this is the most positive spot. So what happens if you take a sound that is exactly the same as this and you play it exactly out of phase? In other words, where your original sound was pushing the most air, you are now pulling away the most. Where the original sound was pulling away the most, you are now pushing the most. What happens? Haha, <laughs> they're out of phase, and they phase cancel each other. 
if the exact wave is played exactly out of phase with itself, it will completely cancel itself out. That, ladies and gentlemen, is how active noise reduction works. Like if you've got active noise reduction in headsets, what it actually does is it takes, uh, it has a little microphone, it takes the sound that's coming in, it amplifies it, turns it 180 degrees out of phase, and that means that the air molecules that are attempting to push on your eardrums are being met with the same amount of air molecules that are attempting to pull away from your eardrum, and your eardrum just sits there doing nothing. Ha! Huh. Cool, huh? It's not a perfect science because getting every sound totally 180 degrees out of phase is difficult, but that's more or less how it works. And that's why if you hook two speakers up out of phase with each other, in other words, you, you mix the positive and negative or the black and red terminals, one speaker will be attempting to push while the other is attempting to pull, right? And instead of them pushing together, they're pushing and pulling and you end up with very little sound and ugly sound. That's out of phase. Out of phase, by the way, can happen with microphones, with speakers. You gotta always be careful, okay? Now, what about two sounds that are, they're not completely 100% out of phase, but they're slightly out of phase with each other? Well, then they slightly cancel each other. And that, that happens all the time in the recording studio, right? Let's say, for instance, that these are both microphones. I should grab some microphones for you here. I, by the way, am in ground control of my own studio. So let's say that these Sharpies are two microphones. And if these two microphones are recording my voice, and I've got one maybe, say, up here nice and close to get that close sound, and one a little farther away to get more of a distant room sound, well, that means that the sound of my voice is reaching these two microphones at slightly different times. And that means slightly different time, slightly different phase, right? Okay, you got it? It's not hitting this microphone at the same time as it's hitting this microphone. They're slightly out of phase. It's not hitting them at exactly the opposite times, unless I got really unlucky, right? So that means if I were to use these two microphones and then turn them both on at the same time, there would be a certain amount of phase cancellation. They would slightly cancel each other out. Whenever you use multiple microphones on a source, like a drum set, you gotta look for that. Oh, by the way, when you're in stereo with your, you know, your left and right speakers, the way what you see behind me, um, the phase cancellation isn't nearly as notable because the speakers are a long ways away from each other, so they're not attempting to push and pull right next to each other. When you collapse it down to mono, though, like a lot of people watch television in mono and stuff, then you've only got one speaker attempting to both push and pull. That's where you find phase cancellation, and that's why every recording console pretty much in the world is going to have a button on it labeled mono that'll collapse your stereo or your uh, surround sound field all the way down to mono to see what disappears. That's how you check for phase cancellation. This is good, isn't it? Are you liking this? You're going to dig this. Um, oh, by the way, I do want to mention we talked about the frequency is from 20 cycles, complete cycles in a second, up to 20,000 cycles in a section, second. So what the heck is this bell scale that goes from about zero bells up to 120 bells? That simple, man. This is Alexander Graham Bell, the first dude who ever experimented, as far as we know, I mean, with, uh, with converting, you know, SPL, uh, sound pressure level, into electricity and feeding it down a wire. He had to come up with a scale to see how good a job he was doing when it got to the other end of the wire, right? There was no scale. There was no decibels. So he came up with a scale and he named it after himself the bell scale, you know. And it was like one bell, two bells, three bells, you know. So in other words, he'd talk into a mic in one end, they'd go measure how much voltage you got out of the other end, and it would be, you know, what'd you get over there, Watson? Well, I got six bells, right? It was a big, broad scale, uh, but it worked great for, you know, the low tech they had. Decibels just basically breaks the original bell scale of Alexander Graham Bell into, uh, you know, instead of one, two, three, four, five, it's got like, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So that's what deci of decibel means, a tenth of a bell, right? So in other words, 85 decibels would be the same as the old bell scale of eight bells, yeah? As would 81 decibels and 78 decibels. And so you get, you know, it's just a basically more fine tuning of the original bell scale. So there you go. 
And it basically just says how loud something is. Um, oh, want to mention, by the way, you're going to think this is kind of weird, right? We talked about the fact that from the lowest frequencies to the highest frequencies, 20 cycles is about the lowest frequencies we can hear, 20,000 cycles about the highest frequencies, and mid-range, I'm going to just mention this. You'll think this is weird. So in other words, the scale is basically about 20,000 deviations, but mid-range, the midpoint is about 1K, or 1 thousand hertz or 1,000 cycles per second. These are all synonymous terms. So why is it? Because that's not midway. Midway down here would be about just a little shy of 10,000, right? And that's because everything in audio follows a logarithmic scale, not linear. In other words, we don't have one, two, three, four, right? We have one to the first power, to the second power, to the third power, which means we have 1, 10, 100, do you get that, okay? So that's why, like down here, if you want to double the frequency down here in the low department, you know, you can go from 20 hertz to 40 hertz and you have doubled the frequency. Yeah, up here, if you're say at 10K or 10,000 hertz, you have to go to 20K to double the frequency, okay? Yeah? Logarithmic, not linear, right? Logarithmic means how many zeros are at the other end, right? Does that, you get that? A log of three has three zeros, for instance. Cool, okie doke. Um, now let's just talk a little bit about some common volumes. Your book has got this kind of stuff in it, okay? As would be measured. I'm gonna go ahead and turn this on right here. My scale is set at 90 decibels, which means, I'm gonna go a little quieter. Okay, there you go. How's that? So you see how the deflection right now is going right up to about zero, right? And that uh, scale is now set at 80 decibels. That means, and, and the quieter things are down there at like minus six, minus eight. That means that right here, close to me, I'm speaking at somewhere between about 70 and 80 decibels, okay? That's, that's how many molecules I'm putting into motion here just, you know, six inches, eight inches away from the microphone, okay? Um, most things in life that happen to you are going to happen between about 40 decibels and 100 decibels, right? The quiet things in your life, the refrigerator kicking on in the background, that kind of stuff, that's down to the more 40 decibel range, okay? Um, the average things in life, you know, the radio that's kind of on in the background or the television it's, that's on and you're sort of listening to it but not really all that close, the, the dog that you hear barking in the apartment next door, you know, that stuff might be more at 50, 60 decibels. Conversation, like what we just have, right? I'm talking a little loud right now, but uh, it's generally going to be 70, 80 decibels, something like that. People shout at maybe something more like 90 or 100 decibels. Here's something important to remember. Generally speaking, people listen to music. When they are seriously listening to music, they're gonna to listen to music at about 80 to 90 decibels. In other words, good and loud, but not terribly loud. That also happens to be the area where the heat ears are the closest to flat, where we hear the best at that volume. Okay, we're gonna talk about that next, uh, next week in depth. So, um, oh, and, and, and yes, loud things, the things that irritate and annoy you, uh, especially are going to be in the neighborhood of, you know, 100 to 120 decibels. Rock concerts can go all the way up to 130 decibels, and that's why people lose their hearing. Okay? Um, so, oh, and I want to mention this, by the way. This is important. The book mentions this, um, and that is... Let's say, for instance, you've got two guitar players on stage and they're each playing through a big Marshall amp. Each amp is putting out about 100 decibels of sound, right? Each, in other words, if I put my little dB meter, you know, out in front of that amp, I'm going to read about 100 decibels, good and loud, but nowhere near ear damaging loud. Both of them playing together, praise God, it does not work that 100 and 100 equals 200, because if that were the case, the minute those two guys play together, every eardrum in the room would be blown, right? It's about 103 decibels is what 200 decibel sources are together. Uh, again, the physical property of getting molecules in action is such that the molecules interact with one another, and it's not straight math where, you know, one plus one equals two. And all I can say is, I'm glad 
because all of our ears would be blown if it were. I mean, imagine, you know, a guitar player at 100 decibels, a bass player at 100 decibels, a drummer at 120 decibels, you know. Man, I mean, a, a rock band on stage would be like 1,000 decibels or something, yeah? That would be a sonic weapon. That would kill everything. Hmm. Okay. Um, so, lowest frequencies humans can hear? What are they, gang? Repeat after me. About 20 hertz, or 20 cycles in a second. Highest frequencies we can hear? About 20,000, or 20... K. K stands for kilo, which stands for thousand. Okay? Hertz. Um, quietest things that we can hear if our hearing is pretty much perfect, about zero dB, although you'd have to find a room that's less than zero dB, and that's kind of hard to do. So that's sort of theoretical, right? Um, and, and everybody's mileage may vary. But most people can consider 120 decibels to be the loudest things that we can hear before uh, our hearing starts to, you know, get damaged. Um, and again, you know, some people's ears are genetically a little superior to others. I'd say don't test it by seeing if your ears get easily damaged or not. Um, okay, finally, a couple more things I want to mention, just kind of about sound in the room. Everything we're talking about, the room itself interacts with, okay? In other words, and we're going to talk about this a lot more in the chapter called Acoustics, but sound goes out, it hits objects, and it comes back to you, right? It doesn't just... I mean, if we were outside in the middle of nowhere with no, you know, no anything for miles around, then there'd be nothing for the sound to bounce off. That'd be like in the middle of a desert, right? But in acoustic spaces, um, sound, generally speaking, is going to hit surfaces and come back. And I want to just mention that uh, that there are a few things. These are terms you're going to hear a lot from now on. Reverb. That's when you make a sound and. Psh, bounces off of all the surfaces and comes back to you. Reverb is almost everywhere. It's just you hear it most in big live rooms, like big churches, that kind of thing, right? Big auditoriums. Delay is when the sound goes out, it hits one surface and it comes back to you. So you hear distinct repeats. In other words, hello, hello, echo, echo. That would be like standing on one side of the Grand Canyon yelling into the wall on the other side of the Grand Canyon. Cool, you got that? Um, and within rooms, by the way, there's also things called early reflections or flutter echoes. And that's, if you listen really close to this, you will hear it in this room that I'm in. Do you hear that? That short little echo is like, they come back pretty quickly, right? Um, and those are, in fact, the, the earliest reflections, early reflections, that come back very quickly within less than about 50 milliseconds or something like that. Okay, almost every room you're going to be in will have those to a certain extent. Talk a lot more about this in our chapter on acoustics. Um, that's it. There's your intro. Hey, for those of you who are actually in the online class, uh, you'll have a quiz to take. I also have given you... Uh, a, a magazine article assignment. Check that out on uh, your course shell. You'll need to do both of those two within the first week, okay? So that's two things, two things for one week. Um, and the other requirement is on the discussion forum, check in and say, hi, this is my name, and tell a little about yourself. Tell if you're a musician, what kind of music you play, if you're in a band, if you want to be an engineer or producer, tell what your experience is. Some of you have already been in the music business for decades. I've had many students in my brick and mortar classes who've got more experience than I do. That's cool. Feel free, man, to brag on, toot your own horn. Tell us about yourself and tell us what you want to get out of this class, where you're going in life, what you want to be when you grow up. I'm still working on that one. Um, and cool. That's it. So um, it's going to be fun. Uh, there is a link on the course shell to the Google version of this book, which will get you going while you wait for your real book to arrive. I would say, though, definitely get the book. I like the real book. If you want to do the ebook, that's fine. It's cheap. Um, and uh, But don't count on the Google book to get you very far because it does miss a lot of pages, especially as we get farther into the book. Um, it's meant to be a teaser to get people to buy the book, okay? So, um, cool. It's going to be fun. It's going to be awesome. This is the first offering of this course. And I look forward to uh, interacting with all of you online. Thanks. Talk to you soon.